Hi, and welcome to a very short introduction. From ancient Greece to branding, globalisation to Homer, and logic to fashion, we'll showcase a concise and dynamic insight into a range of diverse topics for wherever your curiosity may lead you. So here is today's very short introduction. I'm Julian Bagini, lapsed Catholic, failed Methodist, and for all my adult life, a convinced atheist. At the beginning of this century, when I wrote the first edition of my very short introduction to atheism, professed atheists were rarely seen and little heard. In many Western countries, perhaps the majority, being non-religious was perfectly normal, but saying plainly that you did not believe in any god or gods was unusual. Agnosticism, suspension of belief about religion, was acceptable, but atheism seemed too strong, too dogmatic, too nihilistic. Atheists would be reminded darkly of Dostoevsky's old line, without God, everything is permitted, as though lack of belief in the divine removed the mould ground beneath our feet. My primary motivation to write the book was to correct this and many other widely held misconceptions about atheism. Take the idea that atheism is parasitic on religious belief. Some critics argue that without a religion to deny, and often to harshly denounce, atheism is nothing. Even the word testifies to this. The A is a privative, a not, placed before theism, belief in God. But there's something odd about the idea that atheism needs theism. It implies that if no one believed in God, that would not be the triumph of atheism, but its end, as there would be nothing left for it to stand in opposition to. My argument is that atheism is defined in contrast to theism not because it requires others to believe in God, but purely because of historical accident. Atheism as a concept emerged in a Western civilization where theism has been the norm for millennia. Because it stands contrary to the mainstream, it is defined negatively, in opposition to it. But as a matter of fact, the vast majority of atheists do share a basic worldview. They are naturalists, meaning they believe that the natural world is all that there is. Everything is made from the same stuff, the stuff described by physics. This gives rise to amazing phenomena like consciousness, love, art and beauty, none of which require souls, spirits or supernatural powers. Pinning down exactly what naturalism means isn't easy, but it is at least no more difficult than stating what it means to believe in God or divine agency. The fact that not all naturalists completely agree is as unsurprising as the fact that the religious disagree among themselves, often radically and sometimes violently. On this understanding of atheism as naturalism, there are and have been atheists in traditions where that term has not historically been used. In India, the materialist Charvaka, or Lokayata school, is clearly atheist. Arguably, some Chinese schools have also been naturalist. However, pantheistic or animist belief systems, where nature has purpose, consciousness and or intentions, would not be members of the atheist family. Atheism is not therefore purely negative. Atheists are, for the most part, naturalists. But what of the accusation that in a purely natural world there can be no meaning, no purpose, no moral values? This objection is surprisingly popular, I think because our theistic culture has assumed for so long that meaning, purpose and value have to come from some higher source. When you look to the divine to provide meaning, life is bound to look meaningless when you take away God. But although it's true that nature has no ultimate purpose, it just is, things within nature can have their own purposes. The universe doesn't care if we live or die, but we care. No karmic law will punish us if we do wrong but we have good reasons to keep ourselves and others in check. It is telling that societies do not become more immoral and lawless as religious belief declines. If anything, it's the opposite. In largely secular Nordic societies, for example, trust in others is high and crime is low. It takes some adjustment to think of morality as something real, but rooted in human life, rather than in some transcendental realm. In the book, I make the case for how this can be so. At the same time, atheism needs to be honest. The world is a somewhat harsher place without the promise of divine salvation or redemption. If the natural world is all that there is, 
This life is the only one we have, and if it goes wrong, there are no second chances. So there should be no happy, clappy atheism. The human condition, when seen clearly and honestly, is bittersweet with the possibilities for love and joy, but also for suffering and pain. A few years after a very short introduction to atheism came out, we saw the rise of the so-called new atheism, led by the four horsemen, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett. In some ways, this movement reinforced just the kinds of stereotypes I had claimed were misleading. Its leading lights were for the most part stridently anti-religious, keen to stress the evils done in God's name. They were also very upbeat about the godless alternative, even suggesting that atheists should rebrand themselves as brights, not because they were smart, although clearly they thought they were, but because their worldview was so positive. Richard Dawkins supported a poster campaign on London buses that announced, There's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Happy clappy atheism did exist, after all. In the second edition of the book, out in 2021, I'll talk more about the new atheism and its impact. For all its successes, the movement has at least given atheism a prominence it never used to have. It also gives the very short introduction, New Purpose. I didn't want to write the book only to explain atheism to non-atheists. I also wanted to give atheists an opportunity to think harder about what their rejection of God and embrace of naturalism really required. The dust raised by the new atheism has shown that too many people still have a simplistic idea of what life without gods means, including many atheists themselves. My book is, I hope, a concise antidote to such ignorance.